Hi guys, let's continue our second part of the lectures, which is a glucose lowering agents. This is the overview of glucose lowering agents and their mechanism of action on their target organs. Total of 8 groups of glucose lowering agents can be used to treat type 2 diabetes. B1 ions and thiazolidinions are insulin sensitizers which increase the glucose uptake by the muscle cells and adipose tissue. Besides, it reduces the production of glucose in the liver. Sulfonylureas and megalithinides are insulin secretogogues which are responsible in inducing the secretion of insulin. Alpha-glucosidase inhibitors act on the small intestine to reduce the absorption of the glucose. DPP-4 inhibitors inhibits the DPP-4 enzyme that degrades the GLP-1 hormone. And the latest class of glucose lowering agent that recently approved by FDA are SGLT2 inhibitors. Let's start with b guanines. Metformin is the only drug in this class has been approved by FDA. Its major action in patients with diabetes is to decrease the hepatic glucose output, primarily by decreasing the gluconeogenesis. Later, we will discuss the mechanism of it, as well as the metformin may increase or able to increase the glucose uptake by skeletal muscles and adipose tissue for glycolysis. Thus, it will reduce the glucose levels in the blood. The metformin, the red color, will enter the liver cell through the organic cation transporter 1, also known as OCT1. The presence of metformin will inhibit the mitochondrial electron complex from producing the ATP. High level of adenosine monophosphate will activate the AMPK or AMP dependent protein kinase as well as is the disturbing the production of the glucose by inhibiting the fructose 1,6-B phosphatase or FB phase. Activation of hepatic AMPK results in the phosphorylation and inhibition of acetyl coenzyme A carboxylase. This ACC is a catalyzer in red limiting step of lipogenesis. This block in fatty acid synthesis and promote the fatty acid oxidation. In addition, he hepatic AMPK will decrease the expression of SREBP1 expression or we known as sterol regulatory element binding protein 1 result in decreased gene expression of lipogenic enzyme which further contribute to decreased triglyceride synthesis and hepatic steatosis. These events will reduce the hyperlipidemia by decreasing the LDL and VLDL cholesterol. The lipid lowering effect of these drugs requires 4 to 6 weeks of the treatment. The metformin is the only oral agent shown to reduce the cardiovascular mortality. It can be used in combination with other oral agents and insulin. As a consequence of metformin, as a consequence of metformin blockade of gluconeogenesis, the drug may impair the hepatic metabolism of lactic acid, which will cause the lactic acidosis. Besides that, metformin able to suppress appetite, slows the intestinal absorption of sugar, and increase the glucose uptake by the liver and adipose tissue. Compliance to the metformin therapy able to reduce 1.5% of the HbA1c. This drug do not bind to plasma protein and is created unchanged in the urine means that it won't be metabolized by the liver. 
The half-life of this drug is about 6 to 8 hours. Usually, in our practice, we will be given them twice daily or three times daily. Patients who may experience nausea, anorexia, or diarrhea are need to advise them to avoid taking the metformin together or after the meal. Metformin may cause vitamin B12 deficiency. Lactic acidosis is rare but potentially fatal toxic effect. Hence, should not be given to patients with renal disease, hepatic disease, hypoxia, pregnancy, or CHF or shock. Such patients are predisposed to lactic acidosis because of reduced D drug elimination or reduced D tissue oxygenation. These drugs are not suggested to patients who has end-stage kidney failure because metformin excreted 100% unchanged through the urine. Metformin is recommended as first-line therapy for type 2 diabetes mellitus because metformin is an insulin sparing agent and it does not increase body weight or provoke any hypoglycemia as compared to the sulfonylureas and magnetinite class of glucose lowering agent. The combination with other agents are recommended if monotherapy is failed to achieve the glycemic targets. Let's move to the second agent which is thiazolidinedione which are ligands of perosism proliferator activated receptor gamma at nuclear receptors that can be expressed primarily in adipose tissue, muscle, and also in the liver. Pyoglitazone and rosiglitazone are the only available drugs in this class. Thiazolidinedione do not promote insulin secretion from beta cell, but Insulin is necessary for them to be effective. Upon activation of pipa gamma ligand complex bind to a specific region of DNA, thereby regulates the transcription of many genes involved in glucose and fatty acid metabolism, insulin signal transduction, and adipocyte differentiation. Thus, it reduces the production of free fatty acid in adipose tissue. This drug can reduce the blood glucose and triglyceride level in the blood. However, accumulation of subcutaneous fat occur with this agent. The most common adverse effects with TZDS are weight gain and fluid retention. In terms of weight effect, there is an increase in adiposity with redistribution of fat from visceral deposit. Fluid retention with thiazolidin ions usually manifests as peripheral edema, which will cause onset or worsen the heart failure patient. Troglitazone was first of these to be approved for type 2 diabetes mellitus, but was withdrawn after a number of deaths from hepatotoxicity were reported. These drugs are not recommended to be prescribed nowadays. However, for the patients who are currently on this treatment and cannot be managed by other antibiotic drugs are allowed. The baseline liver profile should be monitored periodically. The third and fourth glucose lowering agent are sulfonylureas and magnetinides. Here are the drugs that are available in the market. There are three generations of sulfonylureas which differ one and another through the half-life of the drug as been shown here. The sulfonylureas and magnetinite share the same mechanism of action. These drugs are bind to sulfonylurea 1 receptors which cause cross of the ATP-sensitive potassium channel in beta cell pancreas. Thus, it inhibits the efflux of potassium ion through the calcium channels and results in depolarization. 
The depolarization opens a voltage gate calcium channel and result in calcium influx and the release of performed insulin. However, prolonged use of sulfonylurea lead to hypoglycemia due to reduction of serum glucagon level. These events occur due to enhanced release of both insulin and somatostatin lead to inhibition of alpha cell secretion to release the glucagon. Sulfonylurea can reduce the HbA1c in the range of 0.4 to 1.5%, while repaglinide managed to reduce about 1% of HbA1c. Both drugs are rapidly absorbed and highly bound to the plasma protein. Maglitinides metabolized in the liver by C3A4, whereas sulfonylureas be metabolized by the liver by C3A4 as well as C2C9. Dibenclamide, which is the second generation of the sulfonylurea, metabolized to moderately active metabolites, which will cause high risks of hypoglycemia. The incidence of hypoglycemia may be worsened for the renal impairment, cirrhosis, and elderly patients. Glipizide, the latest generation of sulfonylurea, are the among safest in sulfonylurea which 95% metabolized to inactive form. The sulfonylurea may be used with cautious, due highly bound to plasma protein, Competition for metabolizing the enzyme with this group of drugs, interfering with excretion of this drug, and lead to hypoglycemia. Sulfonylurea can cause weight gain about 1.5 to 2.5 kg. Sulfonylurea will stimulate appetite probably via their effects on insulin secretion and hypoglycemia. Repaglinide has a very fast onset of action with peak concentration and peak effect within one hour after ingestion. But the duration of action for repaglinide is about 4 to 7 hours. Because of its rapid onset, it is indicated for use in controlling the postprandial glucose excretion. The drug should be taken just before each meal. It less hypoglycemic than sulfonylurea because of short half-life. However, combination of this drug concomitant with gamfibrovil, which is lipid-lowering agent, may cause severe hypoglycemia. The fifth glucose-lowering agent is alpha-glucosidase inhibitors. Complex starch, oligosaccharides, and disaccharides must be broken down into individual monosaccharides by the alpha glucosidase that present on brush border of the intestinal cells. Alpha glucosidase enzyme consists of sucrase, maltase, glucoamylase, and dextrinase. Only monosaccharides such as glucose and fructose can be transported out of the intestinal lumen and absorbed into the bloodstream. Acabos and Mignitol are only competitive inhibitors of the intestinal alpha glucosidase, and it will reduce the post-meal glucose excretion by delaying the digestion and absorption of starch and disaccharides. This alpha glucosidase inhibitor able to reduce HbA1c up to 0.8%. The most common side effects are flatulence, diarrhea, abdominal pain, and bloating. The next glucose lowering agents that we will cover are DPP4 inhibitor or dipeptidyl peptidase 4 inhibitors and GLP1 analogs. Citagliptin, sazagliptin, and linagliptin are inhibitors of dipeptidyl peptidase 4. This enzyme, the PP4 enzyme, will degrade the incretin hormones such as GLP1 and GIP. 
this degradation occur within few minutes. The binding of this drug blocking the DPP4 activity, which will increase the circulating level of native GLP-1 and glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide GIP. Thus, it will ultimately decrease the postprandial glucose excretion by increasing the insulin level in the blood. GLP-1 analog is up to 96% mimic to our body GLP-1 structure. Diraglutide, azenatide, and lisinatide are among the FDA approval of the GLP-1 analog. The presence of this analog in the bloodstream will not cause any degradation by the DPP-4 enzyme. DPP-4 inhibitors able to reduce HbA1c about 0.5 to 0.8%. The peak concentration of this drug within 1 to 4 hours and it be metabolized in the liver by C3A4 or C3A5. It is excreted in the urine about 85% and the rest excreted through the hepatic pathway. However, this drug is able to increase the rate of infection such as upper respiratory tract and urinary tract. This drug needs to be withdrawn for this kind of patient, which is acute pancreatitis, severe allergic to this drug and hypersensitivity reaction when taking of this drug. The dose of this drug should be addressed for the renal impairment patient. However, there has high tendency to develop the hypoglycemia when the drug is combined with insulin or sulfonylurea. In our practice here, DPV4 inhibitors will use as adjunctive therapy, especially to diet and exercise in type 2 diabetes mellitus who fail to achieve the glycemic goals. For GLP-1 analog, it able to reduce up to 1.5%, especially for liraglutide drugs. It potentiates the insulin secretion, it slows the gastric emptying, and will cause the central loss of appetite. Azenatide mimics about 53% of the GLP-1, while liraglutide about 90-70% homology to native GLP-1. The special about this GLP-1 analog, it won't be metabolized or degraded by the DPP-4 enzyme. The drug should be withdrawn for this kind of patient, which is necrotizing and hemorrhagic pancreatitis, and for those who develop severe allergic and hypersensitivity when take this drug. The newly approved FDA for glucose lowering agent is HGLT2 inhibitors. HGLT2, also known as sodium glucose co transporter 2, are an ideal target for treatment of diabetes because they are responsible for roughly about 90% of filtered glucose reabsorption. Currently, there are three SGLT2 selective inhibitors that be approved by the FDA, which are canaglifosine, empaglifosine, and dapaglifosine. SGLT2 inhibitor may be useful option for obese patients and also for hypertensive patients because of their weight loss and anti-hypertensive benefits. Patients who are at high risk of hypoglycemia may benefit from a combination of metformin with SGLT2 inhibitor because the risk of hypoglycemia with SGLT2 inhibitor is small when compared to insulin and sulfonylurea. So they can give benefit to atherosclerotic, cardiovascular disease and hypertensive patients. However, SGLT2 inhibitors are contraindicated 
for patients with renal insufficiency less than 45 ml per minute. However, they may be very useful without regard to diabetes duration because their action is independent of beta cell function and insulin secretion. Sodium glucose core transporter 2 inhibitors will inhibit the reabsorption of sodium and glucose in the proximal tubule. High concentration of sodium and glucose will reach the macu macula densa in the kidney. This feedback leads to efferent arterial vasoconstrictions which consequently normalize the pressure in the kidney through normalize the glomerular filtration rate. Salt and glucose will excreted via urine, also known as glycosuria and natriuresis. SGLT2 inhibition results in the protection of the kidney as well as cardiac function. However, some study has reported incidence of genital infections due to the glycosuria-induced mycotic infections. Besides, autostatic hypotension may happen to this patient due to volume depletion and osmotic diuresis. Some study also reported the diabetic ketoacidosis. This diabetic ketoacidosis will cover on the next lecture. So this is how the drug as a SGLT2 inhibition can protect the cardiac and renal functions. This chart shows the efficacy of various anti-diabetic agents and also the side effects. That's all for today. Thank you guys. Keep calm and stay safe. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.